Okay, bands and chains. Anybody here we use bands and chains? And I would have talked about this in the bench press too, but I don't, you know, we're already running a little over time here. So again, this is one of those things that's gonna be a little crossed over. Um, this is a, a reverse. Anybody here ever try a reverse band deadlift? Okay, so all he's gonna do is basically look, instead of pulling against the bands, the bands are gonna assist them. See that? How it's hanging from the top of the squat rack? This, he's actually doing like, this is supposed to be a max, but he's actually does it pretty easily. Yeah, sort of, yeah. I bet you it was inspired by that, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so. So bands and chains, we've all heard of these recommendations for bands and chains where people are uh, doing like, you know, tw three times the bar weight and band width and, you know, they have, you know, 1,400 pounds at the top and like 95 pounds of the bar. So that's fine for equipped lifting. It's just, um, that's not our MO. We don't roll that way in here. So that's great for them. But for raw lifting, we're going to use a guideline of 10 to 25 percent. So. You know, if you're deadlifting 400, you're going to have anywhere from 40 to 100 pounds of band or chain tension on the bar generally. That's not like a law or a principle, but that's a pretty good guideline. Okay. Um, then that's what I showed you right there was reverse bands right there. So not only do you have to pull against them, you can actually use them to assist you. And it's going to have, you know, a similar, it's going to ha be actually, you know, it, it's, it's going to feel, you can even set the bands up where, if you're you're doing it, you can you'll have all the weight yourself, like about right here. So that's just the final completion of a deadlift. So, pretty cool. Okay, lightning deadlifts. Anybody's done these or heard of these? Okay, beautiful lift for develop. These help develop speed in the in the speedless. This is the great Travis Christie. See, there you go. So what we did right there is, um, you see how the chains were on the bar? Yeah. We pulled them off, okay. So that, that's the whole purpose right there. And um, sorry, this PowerPoint, I gotta keep clicking it. Um, what the lightning deadlift does is they, it adds an eccentric overload because you're, it's sort of like a weight, it's like a poor man's weight releaser. That's all it is. So we're gonna do 40, for this purpose of speed, we wanna do 40 to 60% bar weight of your max. Okay, 10 to 25% uh, percent chain weight, four to six sets. And like I was saying, it builds speed in the speedless lifter. So what this is gonna do is teach you to pull so fast we want you to bypass your sticking points. This is great to use close to me time if you wanna just feel explosive. And like I was saying, it's sort of a poor man's alternative to a weight releaser. Okay, so some of the isometrics we're gonna talk about for the deadlift real quickly. Here's a, uh, we're lucky enough to have this person in the house tonight. We couldn't find anybody else to model for it, so we. <laughs> so right there, he's pulling as fast as, or as, like, hypothetically as hard as he can. They're gonna remove that, the pins, then he pull up as explosively as he can. So he's gonna, like on the bench press. It's a prison yard isometric but a little safer. Okay, so that's gonna be a great way to eliminate a sticking point. I call those isodynamics. I had never heard of them before, so just made up a term. Okay, then of course we have um, your iso, oh, I'll give you some guidelines here on the isodynamics. Inside a power rack, two competent spotters that can actually pull the pins out. You want it at about 60% of your one rep max and the pins are set at your sticking point. The whole purpose of isometrics is to get rid of sticking points. It's a sticking point eradicator. So you wanna pull as hard as you can for five to six seconds, return to the bottom, explode up as hard as, hard as you can. And this type of movement would of course be applicable to any of the big three. You can do this on any of the lifts. 
And um, generally, you know, about 60% of your one rep max. All these you're talking about, those being done sumo or conventional? The only problem with sumo would be if the rack wouldn't allow you to do it, but it would absolutely transfer be, do you have the equipment to accommodate it? Absolutely. Yeah, it could be done. I mean, if you really want to increase um, your bent over row, this could help it. I mean, not that it would probably be worth the time, but I mean, for any lift. So the next one's isometric cat contrast. You do this inside a power rack, you're, um, you're going to do it again with this one with, um, you're going to do it with just the bar as hard as you can, rest a couple minutes, then go pull 68% of your one rep max as explosively as possible. Again, this would be very applicable to any of the big three, and this one actually works really well with, um, with squats. Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the deadlift supplementary movements. So you're asking about him pulling with back? There's your picture. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about, the first accessory movement I really like, is the Olympic pause squat. So as Troy was saying earlier, that's a high bar, close stance squat, like an Olympic lifter uses. Just squat as low as possible, keeping good form, like don't get that anterior pelvic tilt or butt winking, whatever they call it. You want to keep your torso upright, keep your stance similar to your deadlift stance if you want to get the direct transference. Keep these in the one to five rep range. These are actually a beautiful tool for physique enhancement. When I was like weighing a lot and you know eating at Chinese buffets every day, I still was able to see some good quad definition upon implementing these. What is the advantage of going that way instead of low bar wide stance? Well, you're, this is a little more, this is gonna be way more like quad dominant right here. Yeah. Oh, so you're trying to work your quad. Yeah. And you're going to get a, like a bigger range of motion too because you're narrow stance and you're going deeper. So would it even be better if you were wearing like heel lifting shoes? I've always done these in heel lifting shoes. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Okay. So we already talked, oh, I'm on the wrong slide. This thing's not working. Okay, next block pulls. We talked a little bit earlier about rack pulls, right? This is block pulls. This is what this is Orlando, the person I was talking about. He, so these are about six inch blocks off the floor. You see the blocks under there? Okay. Okay, so why would we do this instead of a rack pull? This seems like a hassle to set up. Like you said earlier, the flex of the bar. The flex of the bar. The main reason is the flex of the bar. So So obviously block pulls can be used to target specific spots. What, what's the, the problem with block pulls that we have? Anybody? Good point. Any other problems? People like to be good at things. So the problem is if I'm having a sticking point right here, I can maybe like turn this into like a pseudo like quarter squat and get this like there and be like, oh, you know, I did 1,200 pounds right there. But you know, I haven't broke my deadlift plateau. So it, you, you, the, the Russians call it dynamic correspondence. We're actually getting a transfer of training to what you're after. So Kazmaier, you know, you guys all know who Bill Kazmaier is? He took it to an extreme. He used to do rounded back pulls, you know. I'm not saying that's the safest way to do it, but he said every time he missed a deadlift, he'd be like this. So he'd, he'd practice strength in that way. Actually, from a transferring of training standpoint, that's more logical because that's what he's actually trying to, tr to strengthen. But that's the, you know, the, the issue with these is don't become a hero on them. So don't, don't do your strong point. You know, don't, don't alter your techniques so you can lift more of that kind of thing. Okay. So these are actually really good technique reinforcement for like tall lifters. So a lot of my really tall people, I'll have them, their primary deadlift movement's gonna be like three inches off the floor rather than like right on the floor. Okay. And like we talked about, the flex of the bar, that, that's huge. If you're just general fitness, probably not the biggest issue in the world to you. If you're training to be the best you can be in powerlifting, that is an issue. Okay, dead squats. Anybody ever done these before? These obviously help your squat too. These are really good for sumo deadlifters. He's getting down. 
And this is gonna build spartan strength at the bottom. He's just squatting dead weight up from the rack. And if you guys here, who here, who here actually trains here? Works out here, okay? You got a safety bar, right? Makes it even more, so Norm, you could still get under there with a safety bar. Yeah, yeah I mean, you might not be able to do it with a regular bar, but bar. we found a way for you so you can do these, all right? So some of the, um, the, the dead squats obviously eliminate the stretch shortening cycle. Do these for singles only. You're going to look at the weight, the rest periods, and the sets. You're not going to ever add reps. Build, they build power for squats. They build power right above parallel. And that's a lot of times where people actually stick because they get that elastic energy out of the bottom a couple inches, then they get stuck. This will help you power through that spot because from that position, just about an inch or two above parallel, there's no way to really make it like more friendly. It's gonna be hard, and it's gonna make you more explosive. And I don't know why more you know, people that are training for athletics don't do this. It's, it's, there's not a very high learning curve to it, so. Who here has done deficit deadlifts before? Okay, what is that? Yes. So here's uh, me doing a deadlift. I don't do power off anymore, but every once in a while I'll go heavy. Here's me doing deficit deadlifts. This is me and my friend were at LA Fitness and it was just kind of, oh, we never go there and it was kind of fun to cause a commotion there. Don't use chalk. Yeah. Aerobics, Aerobics box there. <laughs> That's not a good idea because it could, it, 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 it was, yeah, it actually wasn't as high of a deficit by the end. It was really flexing in pretty good. But, <laughs> But um, I actually have like at the gym like platforms that are just built. I got some in my garage. They're just built for deficit deadlifts. Like they weren't like you know for something else. So that's it's a great lift for developing you know starting strength. But if you don't have the mo you want to keep them under four inches. Okay, you want to do singles primarily because we don't want to take advantage of that longer stretch shortening cycle. They build starting strength. They even build lockout strength. It's such a long pull. It really feels like you're doing two movements if you're doing them correctly. But if you have like don't have the mobility to really do a regular deadlift, I wouldn't all of a sudden say, hey, let's start doing deficit deadlifts because if you can't get down in good position at a regular deadlift, you know, why make it harder? And plus it's gonna change the technique so much different. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, Johnny Jackson, his favorite lift for building up his hamstrings. He's here with us in spirit actually next door, but um, right here. This is called a deadlift hyper. Anybody ever done these before? So it's on a 45 degree hyper. Everybody see that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. You have a blue machine? It's a 45 degree hyper. I'll show you when we get, if, we, if you're gonna stick around, I'll show you when we get done. At Metroflex, we actually got one that's a lot higher. So a lot of times you get strong enough, you're gonna be able to handle more than a 45 on this. And, and it's the issue is like at, at LA Fitness something when they're using those low ones, it's gonna be such a short range of motion. What's the alternative? What can you do to solve this issue? Make it longer. Yeah, make it longer, put on 25s. Very good, Peter. So these are just basically what I was saying, and um, I keep these generally in the five to eight rep range. Um, if you're able to, you know, again, use smaller plates if, you, if, you, if the range of motion is an issue. Shrug variations to help with the deadlift. Here's some of my favorite shrug variations. Trap bar shrugs, barbell shrugs. Uh, everybody knows a bar, what's a one arm barbell shrug, anybody? No, you actually hold it to the side, so you get a longer range of motion because you're getting way right, down right, there. Right. Yeah, exactly. I thought you meant like, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Because they used to do old time deadlifts like that, so it wouldn't be like totally crazy. The other one's the one, one, two, where we go like one, one, then two with dumbbells. Got that one from Ronnie Coleman. Good, um, Good morning, Here, who's here has done any sort of good mornings before? Awesome, okay. So some of my favorite ones are six inch power. We can go over any of these if you guys want to after we're done, but the six inch power good morning. 
it's almost like a bad form quarter squat. We're really emphasizing that arch on the way up. Sumo good mornings for sumo deadlifters. Okay, traditional just power good mornings. And then um, 45 degree hyper good morning. So if you have like a monolift and you have the 45 degree hyper, you put the monolift right above it, get the weight off on your back and then do the good mornings. That's one I got from Gary Frank and that one's badass, but most people don't have the safety bar, what generally what we use or the 45 degree hyper and the monolift. But you guys do have a monolift here, right? Dude, this is, this is a great lift. You're missing out if you're not doing it with all that equipment, so. This gym's very well equipped. Okay, here's Charles Bronson abs. Hold on. Dakota, how'd I get back? Okay, Charles Bronson abs. He's ever done these before. Who's Charles Bronson? <laughs> no, we're talking about the guy that's the most. That's right. <laughs> He's the most dangerous man in Britain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They have like the Netflix C budget movie about him. This is one of my favorite ab exercises. That's not just a glute ham race. On these bad boys, we'll generally go three sets of six to 10 reps, use the glute ham raise, and you wanna go heavy on them. Okay, this is to really, if you're having problems rounding your back, you wanna to try to correct it. This is like a plank on, on steroids right here. That's all, I mean, this is the best way to describe it. She got told by a fitness publication. I couldn't use that description, but I hope I didn't offend anybody here. Yeah. Plank on good supplements right here. So it's basically standing up for the transference and he's actually using weight. It's not like putting a five pound plate on his back and thinking, you know, this is amazing. This is like, you know, a guy that ain't no spring chicken doing over 500 pounds, so. Yeah, so you just put it in case it, that's a front squat static holds, what that's called. Go heavy on these, two to three sets, 15 seconds. And they also have really good transference to squats if you're having problems uh, bending forward too much, rounding, anything like that. There you go. Some of my other favorite movements for glute, glutes and hamstrings are pull-throughs. Um, anybody know what those are? You want to demonstrate, Dakota? I'm good. Okay. Um, so um, then we have glute ham raises. I think everybody's familiar with those. Uh, Romanian deadlifts, even band-resisted Romanian deadlifts. Those are a beautiful hamstring movement. Nordic leg curls, anybody know? There's like a negative glute ham raise. Those are very hard. If someone says they're doing this, oh, I'm doing sets of eight, and they're easy, it's, they're probably not doing them right. Some of my favorite rowing variations are one arm dumbbell rows standing, barbell rows, meadows rows, and definitely strap up with those, and T-bar prison rows. That's just like the barbell in the corner of the gym like Ronnie Coleman used to do. Some of the, my favorite abdominal movements besides the, the Charles Bronson abs, I just put that one in there because people, a lot, most people haven't seen it before. Standing weighted cable crunches, suitcase deadlifts from about new, knee level. So it's basically like a side bend like this. Yeah, with one arm, just pick up a barbell right there like that. Spread eagle sit-ups and landmines. Okay, now here's, again, like, if you didn't get anything out of this whole presentation, but you just might, might have one takeaway right here. This one's huge for a lot of people right here. This is for grip enhancement. Okay, because a lot of people aren't able 
to grip the deadlift. Now, if you're doing like you're doing Joe like grip contests, I'm not saying this is going to make you win them. But if all you care about is gripping your deadlifts, you don't really need a whole lot more than this. So, farmer's walk. Anybody know farmer's walk? Yeah. Okay. Overhand deadlift holds for about 50, up to 15 seconds. So just double overhand deadlift hold, that's all it is. Okay, barbell curl holds. Some people have had success with that where they grab the, grab the middle of the, of the curl bar with no knurling and hold it there with no chalk for like 15 to 20 seconds. Okay, now here's, these are the so-called secret right here that, that are like crazy. If you're having like severe issues that won't work is pink, pinky pinch grips. Okay, so you get like a five pound plate, put it between your thumb and your pinky and static hold it right there. Because where are you gonna lose your, every time you deadlift, you're gonna lose your grip, it's gonna be on your pinky, right? So you can even do it on, on your uh, ring finger too. So pinky and ring finger, you don't need to do beyond those two. Do those for like up to 30, I mean, it's hard to progress a lot of weight on those, so it's not like, you know, so you have to do them for like longer periods of time after. But you can go on Amazon if you really wanna do these because you're having problems. Buy those one pound, half pound magnet plates and, and do them on like a five pound. This has like been a lifesaver for a few different people. Like um, adding these pinky pinch grips. We just had an aha moment with, uh, do you guys know who Cody Hyatt is? Yeah, he just pulled a big deadlift PR and he wasn't like having trouble gripping everything. And that's like, no, put it this way, his other lifts weren't going up to indicate that the deadlift PR was really on the horizon. But if grip's the limiting issue, you take care of it. These pinky pinch grips were the lifesaver. So, I mean, those can really, if you're having a severe issue, like be really, really, really helpful. Basically, that's it till we're gonna do a little lifting after this if anybody wants to stick around. Anybody got any questions? What's your opinion as far as warm-ups for deadlifts, uh, kettlebell swings and that sort of thing? Um, if, I would be, be fine with it as long as it's not fatiguing. So for me, per, like personally, what I would do if you said, hey, you're gonna need to come out here and max out the deadlift, I would do um, like a little bit of a general warm up, maybe you know, a couple minutes on the bike or something, do like seven, eight minutes dynamic warm up, and then start deadlifting light and work my way up. That's what I would do, but I'd have absolutely no problem with that as long as it wasn't fatiguing.